Um, one of the interesting things that I found when I got down there on this picture bring it up, was they have this was the clinic and this pole right here it was a little solar panel on top that like powers a light so I was thinking that I could try to hook solar hack power. into it so, yeah right? like use the solar <laughs> power and just set yeah. a little router up there right so you can go to oh, yeah. like Home Depot and 150 bucks or whatever you get a 45 uh, watt uh, solar panel that you know it, it's a little bit cumbersome and all that but they're available you know yeah real cheap would that power a router all day like in the yeah. sun yeah, a router. yeah. yeah. and yeah. put a battery yeah. with it you know so that in the evening it would last a little bit longer yeah um, what is it 140 watt no, it's 45 watt you only 45. need about 10 watts to power a router at least to power mine yeah so there's a guy to talk to you, you got you a solar powered router you have, a, you have a solar powered router? Do you have one or not? No, I just. No, I was just wondering if you've done it in general. I've <laughs> never heard of anybody solar powering a router before. <laughs> but if you look at like, but it takes five volts. And how many? It takes five volts at two amps. Okay. And then you just go so to go to Walmart and you buy a whole bunch of these and just tell them, okay, every hour you have to go and change out your little battery. <laughs> Interesting. I didn't know you could go to Home Depot and buy a solar panel. Yeah. But well, so okay. if you start adding up of what laptops take and what the router takes and stuff, yeah. between the router and a laptop, you're looking at about 100 watts. I think a typical laptop, I think, is 90 watt. Now, this is a big adapter, so it's probably more than what you're, if you get a low powered one, it wouldn't right. take as much. But I know I'm maxing 80. You what? My am maxing 80 watt. 80 watt, yeah. So you'd be able to run a laptop and the router, and but then the problem is you. You now have you have a network switch that does PoE to your your wireless. Yes. You need a lot more power to run yeah. that. The injector. Yeah, the injector. And, and right. Yeah. And um, yeah. So. Right. It wasn't Home Depot. It was uh, another. I can't remember the name of this place, but. Uh, Harbor Freight. Harbor, yeah. Harbor Freight. Yes. Yeah. Harbor Freight. Well, and you know you can get all kinds of. Uh, solar power. So look out at Amazon right. or eBay or stuff like that. And I've seen these little ones that are like keychain things that uh, you know would power a, a router for a few seconds or whatever. But it's you know the technology is there. Yeah. Yeah. They they have a lot of sun there, and a lot of the one guy put some solar panels on top of his roof. That's how we charge their stuff at night. It only lasts for a certain amount of time though, with everybody charging. <laughs> oh yeah. I suppose you'd have to, you know, have the conversion to get the battery, you know, the DC to AC and all that type of thing. So yeah, you'd have to have some a little bit knowledgeable about how to set up a, yeah. know, send a car battery and you know a little converter and the solar panel. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for the so presentation. You, okay, Brad. Yeah, thanks for coming. Thank you. Yeah. So you uh, you go down to Haiti with this uh, server in a box or whatever. The database is in there. Yes. Um, so you spend your time down there. When you come back, do you, do you uh, upload that data to a, to a system here? So the idea is that that box would be able to upload into our central repository. Okay. And, yeah. then, and then in it would a few sync. months, when the next team goes down, they take a copy of the database with them? Yeah, so everything can sync when it hooks up. Right. That's, that's our idea. We haven't implemented that. Okay. And that's where you had the problem with the initial, what, is, what would you say, initial number? Or, or um, the, patient the patient identifiers, ID. yeah. So... Building the system, we didn't take into consideration, but as groups started using it, we got a group in Port-au-Prince, and we've got a group in this city here at Morn. Um, they're using it at the same time. They can get the same identifiers right now. So that's kind of a problem. Oh, I see. Yeah. yeah, and so one of the students is working on a solution where the identifier is kind of based on the trip. You can identify the trip, and then that goes into the identifier. Yeah, so you have a problem with reusing the same number twice, yeah. and also assigning two numbers to the same patient. If they get seen... At the same place. Yeah, 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 yeah. That is an issue. Yep, I know exactly. Yeah, yeah. merge patient both charts problems. and all that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And we can't, and because us being computer science guys, we're like, oh, let's just put GUI, GUI GUIDs in there. Right. Right. We're just gonna remember a GUID. Yeah. Like, the things. <laughs> yeah. Internally, yeah. that's fine. You're not gonna, you're not gonna use yeah. that in the real world. Yeah. Well, so uh, I mean, there's a lot of other things I could ask about, and so one of the things is you're just talking about storing the database and, and sharing and that type of thing. Is is this the idea? You know, eventually you do this in the United States, you do this in other countries, and things like that, and share this data out. Are you thinking at all about the sharing part of it as part of the project, or is that just you you provide it to the researchers and you're not really our interested? focus right now is on underserved countries. So we're starting in Haiti, 
and one of the teams goes to Africa as well. We'd like to, we'd like to go anywhere that's underserved. But the concept of that data sharing should be applied in the United States. But we don't have a focus there right now. Okay. And the, the data that is acquired, though, through these trips, we want to use it in research here. Yeah. Okay, so um, the other thing is, you know, the types of information you're storing. I saw, you know, blood pressure and some mm -hmm. basic metrics like that. And it uh, looks like you can upload a photo of a person. Can Is it, I mean, so the limitations would be how much disk space you have for the database. Can you save objects like, you know, scans of, uh, you know, injuries or, you know, the, you know, X-rays and all that kind of thing. Are there just blobs of, of data in a database? Or right now, it's not a blob. It's an actual file that gets saved in the um, the folder. Okay, so you just have an index <coughs> to that patient's uh, information the and all the stores, files. The stores. I think the file name right now is how that's implemented. Um, but yeah, on that, on that medical page, you can take pictures of injuries and save them. Um, but they're they're not saved as blobs. Okay, so eventually, if a patient moves from one of these systems to another one. You know, obviously the patient ID information would, would have to be accessible, and I, I don't know how you thought of normalizing that or whatever. It just sounds like it, no, it's a little bit more challenging point. than that's we have right they, now. Um, yeah. Do they have x-rays and EKG machines and ultrasounds and that kind of stuff? On the last that? trip, they brought an ultrasound. Okay. Um, and then one of, the, one of the other trips, they had an entire lab set up. So I, I implemented um, on the medical page... Yeah, got lab results. You've got all different kinds of things that they can do depending on the trip. Um, so I, I did this little system where these tabs here I can change. Or it's, uh, there's a there's a special account called Super User that only administrators can get access to that aren't part of the trip, and they can go and create a tab that says Lab, and then they can put fields on there. Okay. And so that kind of eliminates the need to go into the code and do it. Um, but that's how we're trying to accommodate those kinds of different tests. Right. But with ultrasound and the EKG and you have image files, do yeah. you store any of those yet? Or you... um, I, we've, we've retrieved ultrasound images because the ultrasound that they brought anyway was like a, a thick laptop that stored the okay. images on there. Yeah. And so we had to extract the images off that just because they saw me as the IT guy and I can do anything down there, right? <laughs> I, don't, I don't know how to use an ultrasound machine, but, right. <laughs> but, <laughs> but it's a laptop. Uh, but we got the pictures off of it. We didn't really connect it to the EMR. Um, we haven't done that. The DICOM images, or, or have you gotten in that, that far? I, I don't remember. I don't remember. Um, so we play with x-rays and, and stuff. You'll, you'll start running into DICOM images, which are probably no, no big deal. When, when they, they could be big. Yeah. Yeah, an x-ray could be three or 400 megs. Um, yeah, we haven't ran much of that yet. Uh, we've we just passed the 2,000 uh, 2, patient level, so we, we've got about just over 2,000 Haitians in the system. Wow. Um, and it was cool down on the trip. One of the doctors um, brought their husband, and their husband happened to be a data scientist at one of the companies out in Ann Arbor. Uh, so we were we were hanging out the whole time, right? Because yeah. both IT guys, and he's sitting up on the second floor. He's a SQL wizard. Yeah. I, like I, I, I'm not a big SQL fan. Like sitting down writing SQL and doing all the and everything. This guy was just making sense of all the data. I'm like, this is That's sweet. <laughs> <laughs> he's probably looking at 2,000 and thinking, what a joke. Well, yeah, I mean, but he, still, he knew what he was doing. It's crazy still how, still how still fast your brain can adjust to, yeah. to SQL. When you use it yeah. every day. Yeah. Are you going to display relevant fields based on uh, gender or anything like that? Because I saw that on the uh, page before this, um, you've selected uh, male, but then it still shows me um, weeks pregnant. Yes. And then, are you going to have some conversion from um, imperial to uh, metric? Yeah. Yeah, so these are like great questions. Um, for this first one, you can't do weeks pregnant unless you are selected as a female. Cool. So the field's um, there, it just disables. Yeah, it just disables yeah. itself if you're a male, because okay. that would be weird. But <laughs> And then for the imperial units in the metric system, um, that's one that one of the students are working on as we speak right now. So they've put a little, I don't think it's in develop, um, that pull request that I showed in the presentation, that's what that pull request was. Ah, okay. So that's, that's a switch that you can flip that'll change it from metric to imperial. Because we, we went down there on and, and, like, one of the first trips, and we did it in the, the Imperial units. And everyone's like putting in the weight as metrics, and the <laughs> BMI is just yeah, way yeah. off. Yeah. Yeah. Warning, like, oh, warning. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we should probably <laughs> switch that. <laughs> yeah. So you've got the admin panel up there. So how, how does the user um, 
security work? You just have a user ID and password? or Yep, so the admin can manage users and they can see this is everybody that we've got in the uh, development database. You can activate and deactivate their account. You can see the last time that they logged in, their roles. Um, they each get a password and then the admin can add a user. One of the things that in our weekly HIPAA meetings that we've started is one of the issues I've put in in the trackers. For HIPAA, you have to know exactly every single time a person logs in, right? Not mm -hmm. just the last time they log in, right? So that's kind of one of those things. Well, so you also have to track who changed a record. Yep. Who viewed a record, yeah. even if they didn't change it. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So right now we're tracking everything. Everything that's done is tracked, right? Everything stamps with a user. Um, Do you want me to turn the camera off as I ask the next question? So um, yeah. this this the concept too is that um, you have records that are stored and you're logging that for like HIPAA pur purposes and stuff. The logs shouldn't be res residing on the same system, right? You should be storing logs off on a on a secured location. Have you got to that level of sophistication? When you yet, say or? logs, are you talking about? So we're just talking about access logs, right? Access logs, okay. Right. So we we can't store those until they bring the system back. And so when they bring the system back, we extract the database and encrypt it yeah. and store it. Yeah, but I don't. Uh, what you're talking about is good security yeah. uh, uh, right. measures, uh, recommendations. It's not a requirement. Okay. Yeah. You just have, you have to show that um, normal users can't can't tamper. The, the the logs have to be tamper resistant. They're always tamperable. <laughs> yeah. I mean, from a normal user, they can't get in there and tamper right. with them. Right. So you're running this on Linux, right? Yes. Absolutely. Is there a specific version of Linux you found more useful, or is We're there something you're using Ubuntu server right now? Good. Yeah. And so I. Like I said, I learned Linux in December of or 2013. 2013. One of our we were we learned C. I mean, say I'm not sure if you have gotten into that yet, but that class was pretty fun. And the professor told us to make a shell. That was one of our projects. Right. Yeah. So I did it, and then a couple months later, all of my computers were Linux. <laughs> like it, it's awesome. <laughs> yeah, you're done. And I, I keep Windows because of Word and PowerPoint. You know. You can get to work on Linux too. Yeah, but.